You wouldn't believe this, Lucas. We interviewed Noam Chomsky about a month ago. Wow. And cool. uh, the recording fucked up. Ah, ah, oh my God. Heart yeah, we've had to deep fake him. And we've done such oh. an amazing job of it that Chomsky has allowed us to release it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it took a lot of time, though, to do that. You yeah, really did that? I thought you were joking. Yeah. Oh my God. No, we totally no, no. deep faked him. It wasn't, no I, I don't call it a deep fake. It was a, it was a deep I clone. Would. We cloned him to, to, clo to uh. reconstruct what he said. Wow. Oh yeah, it was still his words, but everything mm. else was, uh, yeah, synthesized. In his video, we just, we just had to time warp it to get it to lip sync. <laughs> <laughs> so you had uh, audio at least? No, the no. audio was the thing right. that was like catastrophically oh, how did you... corrupted. So we had to painstakingly listen to it and, and spend hours and hours human transcribing an accurate Ugh. transcript. And then Tim, Tim trained a, uh, you know, a clone of his voice to then <laughs> speak that voice. And then we had to re auto transcribe it to get the nanosecond timings of it and then do this time warping to lip sync it with the video. And it was, it was a disaster. Man, I want to, I want to see this. That that was like that was yeah, it's yeah. gonna it's <laughs> gonna awesome. be worth it. It was <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It was quite an experience. Lucas Bewold is an entrepreneur living in San Francisco. He was the founder and CEO of Figure Eight, an internet company that collects training data for machine learning, uh, which he co-founded in 2007. In 2019, he sold Figure Eight for a cool 300 million dollars. In 2018, he founded Weights and Biases henceforth known as 1DB, it's very important that you remember that, uh, a company that creates developer tools for machine learning. Now, recently, 1DB got a cash injection of $15 million, uh, but most of which have been given to us through uh, sponsorship, I might <laughs> add, uh, in its second funding round. Um, as many of you folks know, uh, 1DB sponsored uh, the Lacoon Show and the Bengio Show and, and also the as yet unreleased David Haar Show. Now, Lucas also hosts his own podcast called Gradient Descent. It's absolutely amazing. You must go and check it out. Um, I prefer to watch it on the YouTube channel because you can see the video as well. And he recently just interviewed the CEO of NVIDIA, which is pretty amazing. Uh, Lucas has a bachelor's and a master's in mathematics and computer science, respectively, from Stanford University. And he was a research student under the tutelage of the legendary Daphne Collar, which is amazing. Anyway, uh, Lucas, thank you so much for coming on MLST. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Cool. Well, why don't you start? I mean, can you tell us a bit about your personal story and how you managed to build two very successful startups? Um, well, I appreciate the, the framing of that question. That's, that's quite nice. Um, I, um, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, I, you know, I, I started my first company back in, in 2008 as the market was collapsing and, you know, it, it wasn't like, you know, oh, I'm this person that really needs to start uh, a company. It was like, man, you know, all the interesting research is driven by the training data that's available. People just keep using the same training data sets, you know, over and over and over to death. And they're, they're all flawed in, in specific ways. And so, you know, I really thought that the best thing I could offer the world was helping um, companies get access to, to training that actually, actually fit their needs. And, um, you know, I ran it for, for a long time and, and, um, you know, lots of things happened. Turns out harder to build a company than you think. <laughs> um, and then, um, you know, uh, you know, and then as, as that, um, kind of came to a close and we, and we sold it, started thinking about, you know, uh, what did I really enjoy about it? And, and the thing that I really loved about running, um, my previous company was that was just the, the, the chance to work with so many really smart ML researchers. I mean, I had obviously a taste of that um, working with Daphne and then in my first job. But, um, you know, it, it was it was actually, you know, it's funny as CEO, you get a little out of date pretty quickly, especially in, in ML. And so, you know, I hadn't really been like, you know, watching how amazingly well deep learning was working. And, and I was a, a Go player a, as a kid. And so I had thought a lot about how you would make a computer beat um, a human at Go and, and really seeing... Um, AlphaGo, when it when it beat Lisa Dahl, um, you know, it just blew my mind, and I was just thinking, wow, they're, they're just like, you know, finally, like machine learning is like really, really working, you know, for for applications besides you know ranking advertisements, and um, you know, I just I just really wanted to help um, and kind of help make that work. And so then 
you know, I was kind of tinkering myself, like building models. And, you know, I was surprised that I think it's actually harder to train models now than it was when I was a student back in, in 2004, right? Like, you, you know, you run into like, like linker errors and I'm like digging deep into my, you know, computer science past to like, remember even what's a, what's a linker error? Like, how do I even like deal with this? Um, and so it just seemed like actually, despite ML getting more powerful, it also got like a lot harder. Like the tooling seemed even kind of more broken um, than it than it was, you know, the last time I was training lots of models. And so, you know, I kind of couldn't help myself but start another company that um, that set out to address that and just sort of make ML engineers, ML practitioners, whatever you want to call it, lives easier at every kind of step of the the model training and deployment process. So maybe uh, this is a kind of fun question before we dive into into the more you know deeper technical things. Uh, you and I, you and I, and, and Tim as well, share this this passion for games and, and really a deep interest in games. I would say, and mm -hmm. of course, we've had tremendous success in teaching computers how to play games, as you mentioned. Um, but one area that's always frustrated me personally as a gamer is the never-ending problem of game balance, mm. right? Like especially the seemingly inevitable swinging pendulum when the when the designers try to go back and rebalance the game and you know fix fix the balance problems have you ever wondered could game designers use ai to actually help us create better optimized more diverse balanced game rules and mechanics themselves and have you seen any, any examples of that and if not what, what do you think the barrier is yeah you know i mean we literally work with most of the bigger gaming companies and they they tell us that this is one of their important um, applications. It's funny because I'm not like a huge computer gamer. Like there's certain games that I really love, um, but you know, some of these companies come in and you know, it, like to, to a lot of the people at Weights and Biases, they're like, oh my God, that is like the, the biggest deal. Like we closed, you know, the, the people that make like, you know, World of Warcraft. And I feel like that's a little bit not on my um, radar. It's just not like a game I got super um, into. And I don't know if they specifically use us for balance, but I actually think that's an important application of um, uh, ML and reinforcement learning right now. And I, I guess I'd prefer to let the, the companies themselves talk about exactly how that works as much as they're comfortable. Mm. And I'm sure they are somewhere, but I think that's a that's something that we've seen, um, you know, several times with bigger companies and lots of times with startups. So that's that's definitely going on right now. Good. There's hope for us then. But it's don't you kind of feel like you're being manipulated? Like I sometimes feel like when a game feel like feels like it's balancing live, I'm like, come on, like <laughs> make it harder. I guess I guess the balance is sort of like making sure there's not like a hack to like, um, you know, to to win it. Um, actually, you know, you know, um, you know who's a huge gamer is Andre Karpathy. I don't know if you've had him on, um, on your show, but he was actually talking to me just the other the other day about um wishing that that there was more balance in games and. He had some ideas around using reinforcement learning for that. So I don't know. He may be interested in that too. Amazing. I'd love it if Andre came on the show. Um, consider this your <laughs> invitation, Andre. I did shitpost him a bit on Twitter the other day, so he might not want Ooh. to come on. But, um, <laughs> and by, by the way, we're all, we're all being manipulated. Um, I, want, I want to ask you a bunch of questions about 1DB. I've, I've got loads Please. of them written down. But okay. um, first of all, I want to test your mettle as a CEO and your pitching uh -oh. skills. Uh -oh. Can you give me... The 30 seconds elevator pitch for 1DB. Well, so it depends on the audience. So who are you? Are, are you like a, like a business person? Are you like an ML engineer? Like what's your, what's, who, who am I talking that, to here? That, you're absolutely right. That was the correct, that was the correct answer. Um, let's say <laughs> I am an ML engineer. Well, if you're an ML engineer, um, what I'll tell you is the most important thing is I want you to use it. It's like, we say it's five lines of code. It's actually one line of code with most popular frameworks. So it's so easy to use. You really should just try it. And the first thing that it'll do for you is it'll basically save the information that happens in your models as they train. So that's like the simplest setup, right? So, you know, you'll net, you, I mean, you've all like written down the hyperparameters you used and the state of the code and then tried to go back and rerun training. And everyone thinks reproducibility is important. And yet no one keeps careful enough track to go back a week from you know, a week ago or a month ago and really rerun a model. And and if you add those couple lines of code um, to your training runs, you'll get that for free and forever, right? So, you know, you can train a million models. You want to roll back like 10,000 models ago. No problem. You can do it. So that's like the first thing that you'll enjoy about the product. And, and I want you to do that. But then I think the real value happens when you can use that same stuff 
to communicate with the rest of your team, right? So now you can pull up any model, pull up like a beautiful graph of what it's doing, dig into like how it's using the GPU, kind of whatever it's relevant. And this is all postdoc analysis. And you can share it broadly in a stable place where your findings are not going to go away, right? So not only do you have a record of the model training, but you now have like a record of what you what you learned, <laughs> especially the things you know that didn't work that you know you might not take the time to write down or write a research paper. Um, and then from there, we do tons of other stuff these days. We do, um, you know, we have like a model registry that we just launched, and we have um, some data exploration stuff. So we're we're building like a full suite of stuff, but. Um, my main point is it's very, very easy to start. Take less than five minutes and you'll thank yourself. Amazing. Yeah, um, there's a real problem with machine learning projects in general. I mean, software engineering is, is hard enough, but I think people misunderstand the brittleness. Like if you change one tiny little thing over there, you can no longer reproduce what you've done. But um, I wanted to talk about what I see as the other big problem, uh, you know, because I, I kind of think of ML DevOps as the implementation of software engineering rigor basically mm -hmm. yeah uh, you know and, and i agree totally you know, agree. say technical yeah. excellence at scale for for machine learning but there are so many challenges and and i think the biggest one for me has always been the cultural dichotomy between science and engineering um mm -hmm. agile and software engineering best practices are anathema to data scientists so um how do you overcome that hurdle i think you have to have a lot of empathy from for where everyone's coming from and i, I think that's one of the reasons that weights and biases has been successful is you know, I come from like a more ML researcher background and um, my co-founder, Sean, you know, has much, I mean, they always make fun of me. They're like, Lucas doesn't know how Git works. He just types in like random Git commands, like until he like, you know, gets his state so messed up that we have to go in and like help him. But it's actually, I think that's like eye-opening for, for Sean because Git is so like obvious, you know, to him how it works that I think in sort of like fixing my um, Git problems, he actually kind of learned like, oh, you know, these researchers, they're really smart. Um, but they don't understand a lot of things about how the the machine, you know, actually actually functions, right? They get you know nervous when, you know, they get like weird linker errors, you know, and and so um, I, I think that there has to be a lot of empathy, and I, I do think ML engineers have to unlearn a lot of bad habits that they pick up in school because, like, you know, in school you're sort of racing to get a research paper out, and then the code is throwaway, whereas you know in, in a work environment most of what you do is like after you know, you, you, you train the model the first time. Right. So, um, but I, I think like tooling here can really help. Like, for example, you know, we save a lot in the background quietly by default, you know, and, um, and I think that's really important, right? Like, you know, if you're counting on someone to kind of like, you know, keep careful track of everything that they do, it's just never going to work. It's just human nature, right? Like you, you have to have the stuff happen quietly, um, in the background. So, you know, we go to a lot of companies where people are like, ah, oh, why do I want some weights and biases? I just, I have like a spreadsheet of all the hyperparameters I use. It kind of works for me. This seems like overhead. And it's like, well, you have that now, maybe if you're really diligent, right? But then you hire a second person. Are they going to do that? Then you leave and a third person starts. So you understand what, you know, what you were doing. So, um, I think there's a lot of, um, power of automation. And I think, you know, I think like people resist bad tools that, that get in your way as they should. Right. So like, you know, you could help someone with like, you know, versioning their models, but, or, or, you know, you can have total reproducibility if you're willing to follow exactly my system, right? So if, if you do like all the things I tell you, it's not hard from a computer science perspective, it's like hard from like a human nature perspective, right? So, you know, reproducibility is easy, but, you know, reproducibility without adding like a ton of overhead for you is, is really hard. And so I think the ML ops teams are like, Hey, why don't these crazy researchers just like settle down and follow you know, standard practices. But of course, you know, the researchers are trying to like, you know, produce these models and move things forward and, and overhead is like really frustrating. Um, and I think they also are kind of like, well, what are these, why are the, you know, why are the ops people trying to like add all this like process and like trouble for me? But again, I do think there's like Pareto optimal improvements to be done here by just like, you know, making good, reliable tooling that stays out of the, um, yeah, out of everybody's way. Well, so l let me ask you a bit more about that because there is really this, almost central conflict, which is for the researchers, you know, they're, they're futzing around and meandering and trying kind of all different sorts of things. And, and it is great to have a tool that tracks everything that they're up to. But on the other hand, the downside is it's literally tracking everything. Like it's going to say, you know, Jill's model at 11 AM before lunch and Jill's model at 202 PM after lunch and all those kinds of minutia and all the little things that, that it's tracking, they, they can be important for the individual researcher, um, if they need to go back, but downstream, those artifacts are almost too fine grained and somehow the artifact graph have to, has to be kind of 
highly filtered and aggregated or simplified for it to have any real relevance to what's going on downstream and say the outputs of groups or organizations um, as a whole. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? And, and what's your vision for, for how the tooling can get better to help collapse some of that history into really just the, the history that, that matters, at least for certain views? Yeah, look, it's a real challenge. Um, I think that, you know, our point of view is that we want to check as much as we possibly can um, by default because search can be really powerful, right? And so, you know, if we're, if we're capturing a lot and we're making it kind of easy to explore what happened, at least you have some comfort there, right? Like I don't very often go and interrogate deep into my Git log, you know, but the times I do, boy, I'm so happy that something was just like quietly, you know, saving the changes behind the scenes. And I do mm -hmm. think ML in particular, like, you know, you always hear about these bugs where it's like two weeks ago, you know, someone was doing something else. They messed something up, invalidated, you know, my last couple of weeks of work, but I don't know exactly how many, you know, weeks and like, I don't know, you know, exactly what I should throw out. And so, um, you know, that's kind of like a core use case of, of weights and biases. It's not fun, but it's like really, really important, you know, for making it a, a useful product for, um, you know, the ML researcher or ML engineer. I think there's this other step though which I would sort of describe as like kind of communicating with the organization, which I actually think is a huge piece of um, most ML researchers when they're, when they're in, um, you know, really an industry, it's a huge piece of their, their function is like, Hey, you know, what am I doing? Like, what are my models training on? Like, what are sort of the important milestones? When did I like, you know, push a particular model to, to production. And so what we try to do there is make it really easy for the ML engineer to communicate what they're doing, kind of curate what they're doing right and so you know we have a product that's really well loved called reports that you know it doesn't fit neatly in those like workflow diagrams that every vc you know comes out with and you know it, but but i actually think it's kind of the our customers tell us it's their favorite part of, of weights and biases is these reports where you can basically kind of pull out um like a lineage of of models and we found that people really like to curate that right so like you know we, we were just saying hey you have this workspace with all your models why don't you just want to share that and you can um, but customers kept asking, how do I kind of like, you know, curate the six models that I trained that's like making a particular point, you know, that I want to make, but still have right. that, that lineage. And so we spent quite a lot of time on making that work because so many customers, um, you know, come in and use that. And, and, you know, I wish we could automate it, but I kind of think you can't really automate that like human to human communication. Like I think in the end, that might be the last function that, um, ML practitioners will be doing, right? Like, you know, even if you're just sort of like you know, doing prompt engineering on, um, you know, GPT-3 or something, you still need that, that um, communication step. But I'm not sure, you know, like where, where the space goes. But I, I, I um, anyway, I do think that's critical. But that, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, this, this touches on two things I wanted to ask you about. The first thing that Keith was just talking on is, uh, I mean, what 1DB is wonderful for knowledge sharing, but there's horizontal knowledge sharing and there's vertical knowledge sharing. And I mean, I work in a large enterprise and the, the, the leadership want to um, consume increasingly abstract information, right? You know, which represents the status of many downstream uh, projects. And, and as you just said, you know, the, the, the way that the kind of um, inter-project knowledge sharing happens in, in 1DB is quite open-ended because it's, it's through the interface of, of the reports. So I wondered whether you could just touch on that first, that um, quite often in the large enterprise, you get a group IT function. The first thing they want to do is come up with a rubric and it will be quite abstract. So it'll be, how are we doing on safety? How are we doing on security? How are we, do, do you know what I mean? And, and somehow all of this information needs to magically go up the funnel and, and fit into that rubric. Um, how would that work with 1DB? Yeah, I mean, it's something that I love uh, to, to support because I think I have empathy for both the, you know, ML engineer and the, the leadership here. So I feel like we, we should be able to do this well. Um, and, you know, I think, I mean, leadership loves seeing a graph that's going up into the right. And so we... We help you make that graph, right? So you can kind of pull out the different, you know, models that you've trained and the metrics that you care about. And those metrics could be ones that you valued at the time of training, or they could be kind of post hoc analyses that you did um, on your models. And, you know, we make it easy. To, I mean, these aren't like genius data visualizations, right? These are sort of like scatter plots and, and graphs that are like, you know, easy to consume. Um, but again, I think we make them very, very easy to make and, and like kind of make them accurately. Um, and so, and I think very importantly, we make it really easy to put a lot of text around them, right? Because it's like, if you're just, you know, sending a graph without the context, um, like I, th I think like having a fully featured text editor 
is actually really critical for for good communication um, inside organizations. And so again, you might say, well, why does weights and biases have its own, um, you know, text editor? We we put a lot of time into it, but you know, I think it turns out that if you want to communicate well, you know, letting people use different size text really matters, right? Like, you know, like engineers might be okay with just sort of like markdown, you know, but communicating broadly in the organization, you know, you want to be able to have a richer um, experience. And, and I think like, you know, it's something that, um, that I want to figure out how to support even better because I, I, I care about it a lot. It's a really, it's a really, really important part of making, um, you know, helping the ML teams actually make stuff that's useful that, that people really use. Fantastic, fantastic. I mean, coming back to this enterprise customers uh, topic, so it's of particular interest to me. Um, one of the biggest things which comes up time and time again is around topology. So should systems be decentralized or should they be centralized or, or even something between the two extremes? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so I guess I'm saying like, should there be one, one DB workspace for the entire um, company or one per business? And um, typically, I find that many vertical kind of um, business units, they resist all forms of centralization, right, as they see it mm -hmm. as too friction inducing, and they cite security concerns. However, the central IT function, they think it's a brilliant idea, because it gives them more control, but also it fosters collaboration, information sharing, and, and so on and so forth. So do you have a, a slant one way or the other? Well, I'll say as, a, as, a, as an entrepreneur that's, that's trying to sell a product, I mean, our customers have such a strong um, point of view here that we have to support, you know, both ways of operating because like, you know, I mean, we work with Apple and I think it's like, you know, they, they have like data security that doesn't let them share, you know, even with, with other teams. And so, um, you know, it just be impossible to have like a centralized, um, you know, weights and biases um, product, product for them, even if, you know, if, if there is benefit to it. I think, um, you know, other teams... Um, yeah, like you're saying, they really like to centralize. And I, I would just say from my vantage point, um, I think that you see companies operating in different ways because there's really big pros and cons to how you actually want to structure your ML function, right? Like, you know, ML, you know, ML researchers kind of like to work together, right? And so, you know, you'll see like, you know, like Meadow with FAIR, like kind of putting them all in one um, function. But of course, when you put them all together, you know, they just naturally get a little bit disconnected from um, the the individual teams and what the company is trying to do, which is really, you know, dangerous, right? You know, you can end up like, you know, optimizing the wrong thing, right? We see that all the time. And so there's this really um, strong tension. And I think people notice the problem. So, I mean, you know, we've I've been doing this long enough that I've watched a lot of our customers just go back and forth, right? They distribute, you know, the ML teams like into their organization and then they pull it back out and centralize and they distribute and then they pull it back out. And I, I think that you can't honestly say um, that there's really a best practice here because, um, you know, companies like just just do it both ways. And it's sort of like pick, you pick pick your poison of like, you know, which are you more worried about? Like if you're more worried about kind of like hiring and talent, I think it's more important to centralize. If you're more worried about um, making like use cases actually connect with what you're trying to do, then you want to decentralize it. And I think the weights and biases installs typically reflect the the customer's org chart, right? So like the, the, the companies that have, you know, really centralized teams will tend to have kind of one, um, you know, big install, like, you know, fair has like one weights and biases, um, server. It's awesome. They can like share all their work. It's super cool, you know? Um, and then, but then, um, you know, other companies will have like lots of different installs in some cases, you know, they don't even know about, you know, what the other teams are doing. And, and I think weights and biases actually can serve a funny function of just sort of like letting, you know, ML teams know about other ML teams at their own, um, you know, company when the company is large enough. Fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, the perennial challenge of generalization versus specialization, especially in respect of some of this, uh, um, you know, kind of templatization and standardization that we've been talking about. So um, I, I see this all the time. I mean, when, when I build ML DevOps systems or templates, um, people expect to have a general abstraction or blueprint that just works in every single situation but, and also mm -hmm. in the way that we report information to leaders as, as we just spoke about. And the biggest sticking point I find is that teams prefer specialization. They hate generalization because they don't think that they're a cookie cutter. Uh, they quickly feel that the operating model no longer applies to them. And mm -hmm. this is why it's so bloody difficult to make ML DevOps systems work at scale. Um, I just wondered, uh, do, do you have any any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I I think that you it, well, if your weights and biases, you really have to do to do both. I actually think that probably bigger ML ops functions really should should do both. Like I, I think that you know people do want to. I mean, ML engineers in particular want to do all kinds of weird stuff, and they want a general tool. You know, there's just like there's no getting around it. That's like what everybody wants, and and I think they should want that just because the the field has changed so fast that if you have a team that's like willing to just sort of like sit like fit into a straitjacket, you're probably going to miss out on on new stuff that's that's coming. And so that's why we we actually have a a platform that's really in sort of two tiers, right? There's like you know kind of like a lower level tier that's sort of like basic building blocks. And we actually at Weights and Biases then use those building blocks to build things that are like more solution oriented and more of a point of view. And it kind of helps us because we can kind of quickly build, you know, new stuff because in a way, you know, like, like a database, a, a data set registry is pretty similar to a model registry, you know, and like functionally, but it's, you know, there's some details that, that would make, you know, make them very, very different. Right. And if you don't get those right, if you're just like, Hey, I have like an arbitrary object registry, that's not a very good experience, you know, for, for a customer. So I think like framing it, here's our database registry here, a data set registry, here's our model registry you know, works better. But if you, if we build those internally off the same building blocks, we can also say, you know what, like we have these registry building blocks that we use to make our data set registry and our, and our model registry. Like if you have something else that you, you know, care about and want to track, you can um, build that. Or for example, with our UI tools, you know, we build them on, um, you know, something called Vega, which is a very, very kind of low level, um, you know, essentially like, you know, um, visualization building framework. And so, you know, we had a bunch of visualizations, but it, at some point we're just like, you know what, we'll just expose the, the raw Vega, right? If you really want to get in there and make some crazy visualization, you know, that's great. We love it. You know, like, um, but, but, you know, you're going down into the raw Vega. So like, I think that helps a lot with like the, the learning curve. And I think it actually gives a lot of people, um, comfort. Like, I think a lot of ML engineers, they just want to know that they're not going to get like stuck. Like they want to know that they have like a way, you know, to, if if for some weird reason they want to do something crazy, that'll be available to them. But then they kind of end up like I feel like I've built a lot of stuff. Like um, you know, Jeremy Howard suggested this like parameter importance um plot where it's just like you build a um like a random forest on top of your um uh, hyperparameters where you predict some number um and then or predict you know, some metric and then you just it looks it kind of shows you what parameters what hyperparameters are kind of more important across like the models that you trained. And everyone was like, oh, that's like too simple. I could do that trivially in like a notebook. And like, um, you know, like I need to do like more advanced stuff. But by just like making that, you know, it's like actually like tons of our customers use it, including like our most advanced customers that were like, you know, we need something custom. And um, and so like when you actually watch what people do versus what people say they're going to do, you know, it can be pretty different, right? So like, you know, you can export all your model data at any time. You can export all your hyperparameters. You can make your own crazy, um, you know, way of detecting what's the best hyperparameter. If you do that, let me know. I'd be curious about it. But I think by just making it really easy, you get a simple feel for like, you know, which which hyperparameter is the most important. Turns out most people end up using it if it's like, you know, well done and, and easy to get started. Or like, I mean, it's so funny. Like, I mean, hyperparameter optimization is another one. Where like people always tell me like, hey, do you support this new crazy sweep algorithm? I'm like, you know, here's the thing. Most people are doing grid search. I'm just trying to get people to use Bayesian optimization. And that's like actually like, you know, significantly better. It's a free um, improvement. We offer it for free, you know, um, but like people kind of stick to grid search. So until we get more people doing like Bayesian optimization, you know, it's kind of like, well, I'm not sure if we need to like, you know, kind of go to something even more exotic at this at this point, although we would love to. So we probably will. You, you kind of went to <laughs> right to an area I wanted to ask about, which is in the spirit of... Um, you know, making the right thing easy to do mm -hmm. and available. Uh, what do you see, what's your vision for increasing the tools that, that weights and biases offers around, uh, model explainability, um, AI ethics, you know, just making it much easier for people to understand what their models are doing and that they're doing really what they should be doing from not just correctness perspective, but, but ethical concerns as well. Yeah, I mean, I, it's something that I really care about personally. A lot of the, the people at Weights and Biases really um, cares about. I think that, uh, you know, I want to be like respectful for the amount of like good work that's out there that people don't use. I mean, it kind of reminds me of like, um, you know, hyperparameter search in a way where like SHAP is like this incredible 
project that gives you like all this explainability stuff. And yet, you know, most of our customers aren't using it. It's like free. It's easy to install. You know, it's like, you know, it'll take you like, I don't know, most like an hour to like set it up and, and, and get it running. So I think like a big part of what I want Weights and Biases to offer is like make it really easy to use um, the good stuff that exists today. Because I think like even an hour of somebody's time, there's a cognitive overhead to trying something new. Um, so I, I want to make this stuff like simpler right. to use. I also think that like people, people want to build, I think really advanced, um, explainability stuff. And I, I think it's great. Like I, I, I would not knock anyone for that. I think it's a really interesting direction of research, but if you look at what people are really doing and like where they get into trouble, it's like pretty basic stuff that they would have seen if they were you know, kind of consistently checking the performance of their model across, um, like lots of types of, um, data sets, right? Like, you know, the stuff that you hear in the news, you know, it'll be like, okay, you know, face detection didn't work as well on, on black people's faces. Right. Or like, you know, like voice, um, uh, transcription doesn't work, you know, well with people with like a non-standard accent or like not the American, you know, um, you know, the, the kind of standard Midwest, uh, newscaster accent or, or whatever it is. And it's like that actually, those examples make the news for sure. And they're, they're really bad. I mean, people really should be concerned about that. And, and I think that problem's getting worse, but it's actually, I think it's like almost exactly the same problem that like every company faces where they roll out a thing that's like broken for like a group of their, um, customers. Right. So it shows you that it's, it's not like, um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's like really like this, like, um, people are certainly not trying to do it and they certainly need to like fix it and they're not fixing it there and they're not fixing it all over the place where it like really, really clearly like, you know, hurts their business. And, and I think that the reason that they don't is actually, it's more about um, having like kind of systematic, simple processes than a really advanced um, visualization. So like, that's why I actually think that the, the best thing that we can offer right is just like saving all the models, making it really easy to run apples to apples evaluation comparisons. And it's like, you don't need like a, a crazy visualization or something special. It's just like literally a table, right? Of like, let's like cut, you know, all the different groups of people that like, you know, might be like engaging, you know, with this um, use case and like, you know, what's the accuracy? Like, where is it low? You should look at that, right? Like, you know, if you release a new model, did the accuracy drop on like any particular group, right? You should, you should know about that. You know, you should know about it for ethics reasons, absolutely. You know, even if you're in a, a domain where you you don't think that there's like an ethical issue, you should you should be um, you know checking that. And I think that I think that people typically will check it like once or twice. But actually, what you need to do is check it consistently. And so there, I really do think there's a ton of value in just making it easy to do the basic um, analyses that you should be doing um, anyway. So like that that's that's kind of my my perspective. And I think like. Guys, like Shap is like free, you know, it's, it's open source. It's great. Like well, you should use it. Um, uh, this, this, I mean, I've got a, I've got a beautiful question for you, Lucas. Now, I, yeah. I genuinely, I don't know where you're going to fall on this question, but, uh, cause we've done a show and we, we interviewed Christoph Molnar, um, about interpretability and the uh -huh. problem with Shap and Shapley values is, um, it requires a fair bit of expertise. I mean, it's, it's complicated mathematics to explain complicated mathematics. And we were just saying before about depending on who the stakeholder is, we're sharing information, but the information has to be understandable by those stakeholders, um, so which means it needs to be presented differently. But mm. um, you were just saying, I mean, there's this dichotomy, you know, around should we try and understand the machine or should we just look at the outputs like accuracy? And I'm torn on this because I quite often hear the argument, oh, um, an, air, an, air, an airplane pilot doesn't need to understand how the engine works. Right. Because, mm -hmm. you know, they just do 10,000 hours of flying and they just know the plane's not going to crash. But I would argue that, um, you know, these engines aren't brittle. They're, they're not brittle like machine learning models are. Right. And you only have to look at the benchmarks in natural language processing to realize that optimizing benchmarks is the road to nowhere. So do you think that we should be taking more, you know, more of an effort to understand the machine itself? Um. Well, I, I, I just want to say I'm, I'm not like the world's expert on this topic, so I can pontificate a little bit, but I, I, I want to reserve the right to change my mind or, you know, if someone has a different opinion, I'd be open to, um, you know, to other, other people's views on this. I, I think like my, my perspective right now at this moment is that it doesn't seem very productive to me 
I feel like a lot of people entering um, ML, they want to like actually look, they want to, I want to see the activations, you know, like I want to see like, you know, show me the like, the actual like math that's like happening. And and like, I mean, I just don't think you can get much out of that these days. Like, I mean, I, I think I'm happy people are researching it. I've seen some cool, um, you know, papers that, that um, do seem to have like some insights, but it does seem to me like the more productive kind of inquiry is stuff like, 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 shop where it's more like, hey, let's like look at what this thing does in great detail. Right. And that's kind of a different way to understand it. But I think also I think like a more maybe practical way of understanding these more complicated models. And frankly, I think people can't do um enough of that. Like seeing like where it performs, where it doesn't perform. You know, if I change the training date a little bit, like how does that change, you know, what it does? Like, I mean, you talk about these like ethical issues and the ethical issues are always in the outcomes, right? Like you know, like you would never think that like a, like, um, I mean, someone was telling me that like, you know, you'll train a, like a language model and, and stuff. And, and uh, there's these evocative examples where it's sort of like, you know, like Mexican restaurants is predicting like negative sentiment because of some like implicit, you know, racism. I just don't know how you would like pull that out of like an analysis of like, you know, the, the model itself. It seems like what's really important is like, okay, what does the model actually do? actually do when you, when you run it, you know? And so, and so that, that just seems to me like a lot more um, productive, but Hey, I think it's great that people are, you know, trying to examine how these models work in, in, um, in lots of different ways. And if, if it, yeah, you know, people figure out ways to actually like watch, you know, how the model's like operating and pull insights from that I'd certainly, um, you know, would, would look at that. But if you're, if you, you know, if you have like, if today you have to like figure out like what a model is doing before you, uh, put it into production, um, I would say spend a lot of time looking at the predictions that it's making because that's what's actually going to happen when it when it goes into production. So what are the couple of the uh, really big visionary items that are on the roadmap uh, for, for WANDB that maybe, maybe you haven't, haven't even started on yet, but something that you know you'd like to get to that would be exciting for our listeners? You know, well, something like really exciting um, that's that's coming down the road in the next, um, in the next couple of quarters is, you know, we want to, we want to actually reveal a lot more of our underlying, um, you know, compute platform to make it, um, you know, really possible to build, um, you know, much more exotic stuff on tops of, of, of weights and biases. I think we've, you know, we've been kind of building on our own, um, internal platform for, for quite a while. And it's, it's allowed us to kind of like rapidly, um, iterate, but, you know, be kind of behind the scenes, we've been working really hard on, um, you know, exposing more of what we have. And I think we're going to expose like, um, a lot more over the next couple of quarters. And I'm, I'm particularly excited about this because it's just like the, the diversity of, um, requests that we get. I just, I just can't believe it. You know, like I, I remember like, you know, um, like, you know, we, we added a function that I wondered if, I think OpenAI was requesting it, but I kind of wondered if anyone else would want it where it's like, you know, you can take your like loss functions and just like plot arbitrary functions of those loss functions, you know, just like in the graph. It felt like a little bit of like, do you, do you really want this? I mean, like, you know, OpenAI requested it and we're like, okay, I want to support them. And so, you know, we have like kind of arbitrary like expressions um, in the product. Um, and then like tons and tons of people want it, but then it's like, you know, then people want to make like completely new kinds of graphs. And then it's like, you know, people want to do almost like arbitrary you know, data set explorations and then like share them, you know, with their team. And so we've really just felt this, this pull from the market, um, you know, to make the tool just like super, super flexible. And so, um, you know, I think there's like, we always have a steady drumbeat of kind of like solution oriented, um, stuff, but, um, what I'm, I'm really excited about, um, you know, opening up things to, 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 to let people build more on top of what we have. And, and, um, I think it's going to be super cool. Fantastic. Um, there's a lot of competitiveness in the MLOps space. Uh, it seems like there, there are loads of new companies springing up all the time. One of our friends actually is starting a company which focuses on machine teaching and active learning in ML mm, DevOps, cool. you know, rather than seeing it as a linear kind of non-interactive process from data to a productionized model. Um, I mean, this is the thing we were talking about this earlier, that ML DevOps can be instantiated in so many different ways, depending on the recipe. Right. Mm -hmm. Every single project is is different. And as you were just saying, that it's heterogeneous compute as well. I mean, there are many different configurations of, of how this engineering is set up. But I just wondered, I mean, based on your vantage point, how would you sum up the competitive landscape? Ooh, wow, that's a tough one. I I, I mean, 
there's um I guess from my perspective, there's like a couple buckets of stuff um that I see. So there's kind of like the early companies that do what I would call more of a top down sale. And we don't run across them that much, even though, you know, I think they make, you know, great products that are really useful for their customers. They tend to appeal more to like, you know, the, the CIOs or, um, you know, VPs of engineering. And if you're, you know, if you're running one of those companies, I, I hope I don't offend you. This is truly like what I, what I see in the market. Um, you know, so I see like a, like, um, you know, data robot and like domino data, you know, they, they've, you know, they've built big businesses, um, with kind of like a like a top-down sale and like they've really kind of and like you know if you go to like someone high in organization that's responsible for ml what they want is just like look make my life easy i don't want to buy a bunch of different kinds of tools i want to buy like one thing that's going to basically solve my ml problem and so what those companies do is they just sort of like solve your problem you sort of bet i feel like you bet your company in a way on the like you know data robot data IQ. and those are really interesting products but kind of not what we do and so i'm really not like a super expert um you know on these on these things and we don't really come across them much um in the market um then i think there's like there's kind of the cloud providers offerings which are like you know changing all the time right you know you see like there's like SageMaker and like vertex and um uh azure studio and i even start to maybe put like databricks in this category like they're getting big enough where these are definitely not like kind of monolithic things that you need to buy into um but it's kind of unclear to me like where they begin and 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 end you know so it's like i feel like like you know i'm constantly kind of updating you know like the the sales team on like okay like how do we like work with these things and people are always asking us like okay like how do you you know you work with them and, and the way that we work with them is like oh it's changing and it also depends on you know the you know the customer and how they like set things up like i i don't know if any company has like you know bought every single one of SageMaker's, you know, products. Um, and, and even like, you know, what people think SageMaker is, is kind of different in, in different, um, you know, companies, but they have a lot of adoption. All of those do. Um, and it's exciting to see. Right. And then you see this like explosion of, um, of startups kind of all with different, you know, points of view, like often like, you know, kind of solving like one of the, the pieces of a thing that like, you know, like I say, like might be one of sort of SageMaker's like, um, you know, applications. Um, and, um, and, you know, you just see like every possible, like, you know, take on the market. Like, I don't know how people, um, you know, keep track of all this. Like, I, I feel like investors, like every week, like my own investors send me this thing. Like, Hey, what is this? Like, do you compete with them? And it's like, man, I, I like, haven't like, I haven't like heard of them, you know? And, and so, um, you know, it's, it's very, very hard to, uh, to keep track of, I don't know if I have like any advice to someone that's trying, I don't even know what I would do if I was like on the other side and I was trying to, um, uh, decide. I mean, I guess I probably had by weights and biases, but you know, other than that, um, you know, I don't even know how I would, how I would think about it. I, I think there's a tension within companies that management, I think wants to kind of standardize on one thing. Typically the, the researchers want the flexibility to use like lots of different stuff. Um, my approach is to kind of try to do the best of both worlds where it's like, look, like we'll, we'll try to have as many offerings as possible, um, but make them work together nicely so that, you know, the, the bosses can have comfort that, you know, weights and biases is a reasonably complete solution that solves lots of their problems and they're not going to have too many, you know, different tools, but then, um, the researchers can know like, look, if you want to, you know, if you want to swap out our, um, our data set tracking to like, you know, a competitive product to weights and biases, like you know, we're committed to supporting that and making that, you know, work well. We obviously can't make it work quite as well as our own um, product, but we also like know that we can't be everything to everybody. And if, you know, if people want to use a different thing for any piece of what we do, we try to make that work well. Cool. Fantastic. Yeah. I was going to ask about that because in, in a large enterprise, typically the IT folks, they want to reduce the technology divergence and complexity. They want to reduce totally. the number of vendors. It's quite difficult to get you know, um, ordained in a large enterprise and, and there's this tendency just to kind of regress to the, um, I don't know, to, to SageMaker or Azure ML or something like that. So you'll always be kind of, um, having this battle of, well, how differentiated are you over SageMaker or Azure ML? Uh, what mm -hmm. would you say to that? What I always say is like, just try the products. Like, I, I mean, if you're not, you know, if you're not convinced, I'm, I'm not going to like talk you into it. 
it takes five minutes to try weights and biases. Just like try it. And if it's not like night and day, use SageMaker experiments, you know? But I'll tell you, Amazon's a customer. So like, why is Amazon a customer of weights and biases? You know, I don't know. <laughs> Great answer. Great answer. Well, you heard it here first, folks. Just try it. Yeah, just try it. Just, just, just try go it. and try it. Here's another question. Like, why would you use TensorFlow? Why, like, why would you use weights and biases over TensorFlow that I, that I get a lot? And I think that, you know, I think what weights and biases really does well is we, we listen really carefully to what, you know, ML teams want and we listen carefully to what, you know, IT teams want. And we, we really try to like, you know, produce that thing. And that's all I'm thinking about all day long. And so, you know, if you go like a feature by feature checklist, we have a bunch of features that I'm proud of, but like what I'm really actually proud of is just that the thing is like really nice. Like it's like a joy to use. It like makes all the things that you typically do like easy. And if you complain, we're actually like listening, you know, like, I mean, if you want to send me an email with like a feature, because not sure that like we'll necessarily do it, but we're li we're listening like carefully and we're trying to do it. Yeah, that, that is a differentiator. And one of the best things for 1DB about me is the community. And so uh, we've got Sanyam, uh, we've got all of the folks, there's a really, really cool Slack channel. They're all over the internet, actually. And probably it, it's quite... Um, it's quite differentiated, isn't it? I, I don't really see that level of social impact from any other machine learning startup. I mean, for example, you're, you're sponsoring a whole bunch of the machine learning uh, YouTube channels. I mean, is, is that a core part of your strategy to like really kind of show a friendly face and get out there? Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's also like a pretty clear um, ROI. So that, that makes it easy. Like I think, um, you know, early on we sponsored two minute papers and I think we did it kind of because like a lot of us just like watched it. Like, you know, we were kind of like thinking like, you know, if we we're going to sponsor anything, like let's, um, yeah. And, and we had this like absolutely crazy, um, sign up rate from, from two minute papers. Cause it was like exactly, you know, our, our audience. And so, you know, we have a point of view, right? Like, I mean, we called it, we named our company weights and biases. It's obvious that, you know, we went a long time without having like professional, you know, marketing around. They probably, you know, would have told us to you know, make a name that has a standard pronunciation that, you know, doesn't have like bias in it when like ethics and AI is such a big um, issue. But, you know, we wanted to like take a point of view that um, we're really on the side of the people that are that are building the the models. And so that's that's the brand I want is like, you know, hey, this is like a helpful company that's here. Like, I mean, my feeling is like anyone that wants to like, you know, build a model, deploy a model, like use ML, like I want us to support them. I want us to have like useful content for them. Like I want it to, you know, I want to, I want to serve that group of people and everyone else, like I'd like to help them, but they're not our core audience. Right. So if you're, um, you know, if you are an ML practitioner and you think our website's stupid, like, let me know, like, I want to hear that. Right. But you know, if, if you're my mom and you think that my website's like really confusing, like I will listen, but I'm not necessarily going to like change the, um, you know, the website, right. Or like, it's amazing how many people are like, you know, like in my life, I'm like, oh, Lucas, your website like makes no sense. And it's like, well, look, you're not like our audience, you know, like, like the website's like not, you know, designed um, for you. And so we try to like, we, we're not a huge company. We don't have like a lot of um, marketing resources, honestly. So it's great that, I mean, you actually are our core audience. So that's probably why you're, you're seeing us everywhere. But I think most people are like, you know, geez, for like a, like a unicorn startup, like you, your brand is, you know, isn't, isn't really out there, but I think people that are like potential customers do, do feel that way. So that, that makes me really happy. Excellent. Well, folks, just try it. Just try it. Uh, so maybe shifting gears just a little bit. Um, I wanted to get your take on something because, uh, you said something interesting in, uh, one of your recent blogs where, you know, it was really the, the rise of, of deep learning of, of neural networks that kind of changed your mind in a way on the importance of the algorithms themselves. Whereas previously you, you just thought, hey, the data is what matters. Algorithms don't really matter so much. But but this rise of deep learning convinced you that the algorithms do in fact uh, matter. And for sure, you know, deep learning has succeeded in many areas. However, uh, as we've discussed many times on our show, in fact, deep learning is limited, you know, not just in practice, but it, but theoretically it's limited in, in fundamental ways. And so now that we appreciate the importance of algorithms themselves, I'm wondering what your take is on, on alternatives for machine learning, things like evolutionary algorithms, you know, disc discrete program search, um, geometric deep learning, you know, things like that. Mm. Um, 
Are you trying to get me into a, a flame war here? I feel like sometimes I like step on these third rails that don't even know exist. No, no, no. It's... And it's funny because I, I think I, I yeah, it's funny because like what I studied in school is like, you know, base nets and support vector machines. And so, um, it, and I remember like, you yeah. know, neural nets were kind of like, um, you know, people were, were kind of like poo-pooing it, even though I think they were like working pretty well at the time. And so I think like what I've seen in my life tells me that like when something is like working, really pay attention to that. And of course you have to have like a rigorous definition of working. And I think like, you know, these evaluations are all flawed in different ways, but I do think if you have, if you have a useful algorithm, what would get me excited personally is like, if you can find a, you know, a way to evaluate it where it really does better than, um, other algorithms, like that's like what I've kind of seen in my life as a sign of something, you know, starting to work. And that's, that's where I would start to um, to dig in. I mean, I'm, I'm like sort of aware of like, you know, genetic algorithms working in sort of like, um, uh, architecture search and, um, but I, you know, I, I guess I'm, I, I don't think of myself as kind of a dogmatic person here. And I get a little suspicious when people are like, oh, surely like, you know, this approach should work from first principles because like, I feel like we've been wrong, you know, so many times with that sort of like line of reasoning or just what I've seen in my career is that line of reasoning is really dangerous and will kind of send you down, um, you know, unproductive paths. But I'm also like, look, I'm happy there are lots of people out there, um, you know, trying stuff. And I'm, I'll like cheerlead it, you know, from the sidelines. I'm a little surprised. I feel like Twitter gets a little bit like nasty on this, um, on this topic. And I don't totally understand it. Like, I, I don't think I like share other people's sort of like, passion about like right. a particular um ml ml approach i mean i think it'd be really I, I hope in my life i get to see a few more waves of um you know really you know radical new approaches doing cool things that we hadn't seen before well and that's what i'm that's what i was really exactly kind of asking is and, and i'm glad to hear that you know you're not dogmatic and you would like to see alternatives so i'm wondering if if you know Juan db over time will kind of pay attention to hey something interesting over here is going on. It's not deep learning. It's not neural networks, but you know, we should support that too, because if we make yeah, it yeah. easier to do well, that and try it out, it'll help to diversify the, the algorithm space. Totally. And, and look, we'll, we'll integrate with anything. We're always looking, you know, for stuff to integrate with. And I think, you know, I mean, my background is really in boosted trees. That's what I did most in my beginning of my, um, you know, career. So we, we do, in my opinion, we have great boosted trees. Me too, trees by the support. way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cause they, they were so powerful, you know, like I, I mean, I actually, I didn't do them at school. And then when I, you know, I went into industry, I was like, wow, this is such an awesome, versatile, um, you know, like approach. I love it. So I, you know, and, and I probably spent more time with scikit than like any other, um, you know, library. So, so absolutely. Like, you know, we want to support, you know, everything that, that, you know, that we see, and we've hopefully made it easy for third, I mean, you know, over 9,000 GitHub libraries require weights and biases, and we're happy to work with anyone to improve the integration because it helps everyone. So, I mean, if there's a useful library out there that we don't integrate with, I would love to know about it because we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll ask for yeah. an integration. I, I, I think you, you easily could pivot in the future because even for example, let's say deep learning, um, became obsolete and we all moved towards, um, expert systems again. Um, I kind of think of one DB it's not necessarily data, it's, it's information, right? Mm -hmm. And information can be events. It can be just people using systems, right? It could be absolutely anything. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an incredible platform for sharing information and presenting it in ways which are understandable to different people. So I think you've got loads and loads of runway there. But um, on, on that issue, though, I wanted to ask you a little bit about entrepreneurship and, and scaling a business and speaking with investors and so on. And, and probably like the main thing when you scale up a business is this thing that I just said, which is that you need to give people targets and they need to kind of vertically give you information. And you were saying earlier, you want the, you want the graphs to keep going up, but not always, right? Because you've got to give them targets which are abstract and understandable, but also actually represent some form of success that they're actually doing the thing that you want them to do. So I just wondered, I mean, you've got a, a, a fantastic vantage point. Could you tell us about how you did that? Yeah, totally. You know, it's funny, Peter Wellander, who's like a, a VP at OpenAI, really like I'm, I'm kind of stealing his points here, but they, I, they really resonated with me. That um, I think like actually training models and running a company has like a lot of similarities where, you know, you have sort of like a limited amount of resources to, to do to try to get something to happen. 
and you kind of need to know when to like cut things off and like, you know, how much, like this, it's really like explore, exploit, you know, trade off that's like really kind of tricky. And you're always kind of making decisions without as much data as you wish because like collecting more data kind of costs you something. So, um, you know, the way, the main way that I try to manage is really through, um, goal setting. And so we're, we're like, we're pretty obsessive here about, um, you know, kind of work. And it's not like top down goal setting. It's like, I really try to work with teams. And I, what I try to get is actually like everyone eventually gets on the same page through like long conversations around like, you know, kind of what goals make sense. I, I try to say, here's like the things that I really care about. Right. And these are like, you know, we want to make our, like anybody that uses the product, like really happy. Right. And we, you know, we measure that through NPS primarily and a zillion other ways. Right. We also want like more people to use it. Right. We also want, um, you know, to, to grow our sales. And so like, those are things that I really care about. And then I really tried as much as possible to like delegate that stuff into the, the individual teams, but also be like super rigorous about like tracking it. Right. And, and not in a way of like, Hey, um, you know, if you miss it, like you're fired. Cause actually that actually kind of breaks the goal set. When people are afraid of goals, I think it can cause like weird things to happen. Um, so it really has to be as like, Hey, look, this is what we're trying to do. And the goals are really articulating that. And then like when it's not working, we really want to be like honest with ourselves. And I think a lot of companies, that's where it breaks. Like you set a bunch of goals and you kind of forget about them over time or like, you know, things kind of change, but you're not like explicit. So I think it's like the retros actually that really make goals, you know, powerful. So like, you know, once a quarter, the whole company gets together and we look at how well we did. And I actually think from my perspective, that's like the main way that I manage is through like setting the goals for the quarter and then like really thinking about the retro. And then like from that, it's like, okay, what are the next set of goals? Um, you know, that we set. And I think at the scale that we're at now, there's not a whole lot more that I can, I can do besides, you know, going on podcasts and trying to, you know, spread the word about what we're, <laughs> what we're trying to do and, and hire great people, of course. Right. That's like, you know, th those are kind of the key, um, the key things that you, that you need to do. But, you know, in a way, like, you know, when you're trying to like write a research paper, it's like, you actually have this very clear goal. Almost it's too clear. Like the, usually these goals are a little bit um, not quite what you would want in like the real world. Um, but it is like a similar situation of like, you know, like I want to beat like the state of the art, um, you know, with this thing, there's sort of infinite space of like things to try, you know, like which parts should I be focused on? How do I break it up into smaller tasks to achieve that? Um, so I think there is, there is a fair amount of overlap. Amazing. And by the way, I can attest to Lucas's engineers and, and, uh, and content engineers and, and community evangelists, They're absolutely fantastic team. Amazing. Anyway, um, Lucas, thank you so much for coming on our, our podcast. We really, really appreciate you taking the time. It's been great. Awesome. Thank you so much. I'm yeah, looking forward to you. this. All right. Have a good one. Amazing.